Welcome back to the discussion of the essay Ideological Effects of the Basic Cinematographic Apparatus by Jean-Louis Baudry. In the next section titled Projection the Difference Negated Baudry talks about the difference between a still camera and a movie camera. A still camera captures a still image, a single image. But unlike that, the movie camera captures a series of discontinuous and disparate images, separate images, from a variety of perspectives. And it is the projection operation, that is the projector and the screen, you know, projecting the film onto the screen, projecting the images onto the screen, that is called the projection operation, which restores the continuity of movement to the series of captured still images. So, Objective reality out there is captured by the movie camera, but not in one flow, not in a stream, but rather the moving images we see are actually broken down into several continuous still images, adjacent still images, which are almost the same, but not quite. And when we project these at a particular speed onto the screen, then these disparate, discontinuous images seem as if they flow in a continuity. So that, that is how continuity is, continuity of movement is created. The illusion of continuity is caused by the persistence of vision. And this illusion of continuity produces the meaning effect. So the images that we see, we know what is persistence of vision. It is a particular quality of our vision where even when we see an image, even after that image is physically removed from our sight, the uh, image remains in our vision for a fraction of a second. And it is this persistence of vision that is being used to create an illusion of continuity. Now, this is just a very simple example of a, this is an image of a film reel, couple of film reels. And here we can see that in this film reel, in the earlier celluloid film that we used to have before digital uh, filmmaking started. So in these film reels, we can see that each of the images are almost exactly the same, but there are small differences. And when we project them together, then the images flow into one another and that is because you see one image and before that image completely is removed from your vision the other image the next image is projected so it goes so fast at a very specific speed and that is what makes it look as if these images are moving so what we see is movement rather than a series of still images when projection works properly the differences between adjacent images are erased so as to provide an impression of smooth continuity. That is how it is supposed to work. If the projection works at that uh, re required speed, then the you don't think about them as individual images. You don't even think about the differences between each of these adjacent images. Instead, you get a, an impression of smooth continuity, of smooth motion. But when projection breaks down, the discontinuity of images creates a disturbing effect, breaking the illusion and making us aware of the projection technology through its failure. So in earlier times when we used to go and watch movies, sometimes there will be these moments when projection breaks down or there is some problem or maybe, you know, just that moment when you finish one reel and you are moving on to the other, sometimes there will be a little bit of disturbance on the screen. You can see something moving on the screen and there actually the projection is breaking down, the technology is breaking down. It is only then that we become aware of the technology. When projection technology works well, we are unaware of the technology. We are only looking at the images and being immersed in the story. But the moment technology breaks down, we are made to remember that actually this is something artificial that is being projected here. A particular technology is being used to project it and that breaks our sense of realism. The illusory or ideological effect of the apparatus works only by hiding the functioning of the apparatus. The moment we are made aware of the apparatus, the illusion breaks. So this is one of the most important points that Baudry makes in this essay. 
and towards the end of this essay we will go into it this in a bit more detail but this is the most important point that whatever is projected the 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 movement that is projected the continuity that is projected is all illusory it is an illusion created by this particular technology and that illusion can be maintained only so far as a technology works properly and by working properly the technology has to hide itself the moment the technology stops working properly we become aware of it and when the apparatus is when the technology intrudes into our awareness then the ideology no longer works then the illusion no longer works now why does all this matter to us that is explained a bit further in the next section called the transcendental subject now who is the viewing subject of cinema or what is this position we already mentioned that the viewing subject is not a person but a particular position or location that you have to occupy in order to view this particular uh, art form now unlike painting theater and photography which have a certain inertia with respect to the viewing subject the movie camera is characterized by its movement so we saw in the case of the camera obscura or even in the case of renaissance art we saw that there is a particular position that the viewing subject should occupy so that you get the most uh, you, so that you get the best view of that image and this is true in painting in still photography and even in theater because you have to even though you know theater is more three dimensional you still have to sit at a particular place in the center in front of the uh, stage that is the best way to see the to get the best impression so if you sit too much to the side in a theater we are talking about a drama theater if you sit too much to the side in a theater then you may get completely different uh, things like you may see what is happening backstage or you know so you have to sit in a particular position so painting theater and still photography impose a certain kind of inertia you can't move around you have to be in one particular uh, place but unlike that the movie camera is characterized by its movement now this is again interest uh, important we are not talking about where you should be sitting in the movie theater while watching it what he is saying is that the movie camera captures see whatever wherever you sit in the uh, theater what you see is what has been captured by the movie camera so in a sense the person who is sitting in the theater is not the viewing subject but rather the viewing subject is put, is uh, identical with the eye of the camera now since the camera moves and captures images from all directions its viewing subject is not one that is limited in space but rather a transcendental subject that is the viewing subject of cinema transcends its position within the objective or material reality so uh, for example even though we say that the eye of the camera is uh, you know continuous with or is uh, similar to the eye of the viewing subject it is a fact that because of technology the eye of the camera can capture a lot of things which the eye of the subject cannot now this may be certain angles you capture the one same the same object from different angles including some angles that may not be accessible to a real person for example if you look at drone shots shots from above or drone shots from far above that's actually not something that a viewing subject can normally have but it is something that is facilitated by technology also if the camera is put into some very small place nowadays it is much more possible with digital cameras but you know if you put the camera in that kind of an angle it may not be an angle that an actual person can sit crouch and look at but with the camera it is possible again not just about angles but if you think about uh, you know um, showing fast movements or uh, showing slow motion all this is possible or freezing Uh, all this is possible with the camera technology which is not necessarily possible for a person who is watching you can't freeze a moment that you are actually seeing thus the camera shows you things that are not available for you to see if you were a viewer in objective reality 
Thus, the viewing subject that is constituted by the camera, by the movie, movie camera, is actually a transcendental subject. It transcends, it goes beyond the possibilities of the actual person who is watching it. The viewing subject of cinema transcends its position with an objective reality or with a material reality. Now, the next step is to say that the captured image is always an image of something, an image that has been constituted by consciousness. So, as we had said earlier, even before you start capturing an image with a camera, you plan it, you plan the sequence of shots, etc. So, anything that is captured by the camera has an intentionality behind it. So, there is some consciousness that is constituting that image. The multiplicity of aspects of the object in view refers to a synthesizing operation and to the unity of this constituting subject. This is a bit more difficult but again it's not that difficult. It's again a very important point. You are capturing one image from a multiplicity of aspects, from a multiplicity of viewpoints including as we said some that are not available to an ordinary human eye. And when you bring all these multiplicity of aspects together, the multiplicity of angles together, we get a synthesized image. The particular object that we are capturing looks as if it has been synthesized, looks as if it, there is a totality to it. Synthesizing, there is a sense of artificiality, but synthesizing basically means bringing many small things together to create a larger whole. Analytic, synthetic, that's synthesizing. And thus, an object is given an impression of totality, an impression of unity, which that object may actually lack. But through technology, that object is given a certain kind of unity. And this contributes to the unity of the constituting subject. Again, as we said, because we see the object from, even from angles that we normally cannot see, there is an extra uh, something to the uh, totality of that object that makes us believe that actually we are also unified viewing subjects even though we are actually less than the viewing subject of the camera. The viewing subject of the camera can see things from many more angles than we can but still we identify ourselves with that viewing subject and we believe that we are as Unified, we are as powerful, so to speak, as that viewing subject. This is part of how ideology works. Ideology works through the technology that creates this synthesizing operation, making us believe that we are indeed a unified viewing subject. The continuity necessary for the constitution of meaning is an attribute of the subject that constitutes meaning. It both supposes the subject and circumscri circumscribes his place. So, when there is a continuity to the object, there is a meaning that is being constituted. And as we said, there is a consciousness that is constituting meaning and we believe that it is our consciousness. And therefore, we suppose that we are the subject, we are the viewing subject. So, the viewing subject comes into existence as we imagine that this is we ourselves, our gaze that is constituting this particular object that we are seeing through the movie camera. It supposes the subject. So the camera, when it is capturing an image, is supposing a subject. But it also circumscribes the place of the subject, which is to say that the subject, the viewing subject is precisely what the camera sees. You can't be anything more than what the camera sees. Actually, you are less than what the camera sees. Your potential to view things is less than the, that of the camera. But the camera makes you believe that your gaze is identical with that of the camera. And in no way can you see anything that the camera doesn't allow you to see. Now, moving on about continuity, narrative continuity. Narrative continuity is basically the continuity of the narration, right? There is formal continuity, which is 
as we were saying the you know uh, the through the persistence of vision how disparate images seem to look together to to flow together that is formal continuity but apart from that there is also narrative continuity narrative continuity is produced through editing and specifically through this technique called montage which you have already studied montage according to pudovkin this is uh, as quoted by Baudry, montage is the art of assembling pieces of film shot separately in such a way as to give the spectator the impression of continuous movement. So, on the one hand, the very uh, technology of projection creates a certain formal continuity. And narrative continuity is when the editor actually decides, okay, I will cut this piece of film here. I will merge it with another piece of film. This scene and this scene should be, this shot and this shot should be merged together. So that technique of editing, which is called montage, the art of assembling pieces of film shot separately so as to give the impression of continuous movement. This is what results in narrative continuity. And the reason for narrative continuity is essentially ideological which is to preserve at any cost the synthetic unity of the locus where meaning originates. And the locus where meaning originates is the subject. So we cannot have fragmented images because that will make us feel that we, the viewing subjects, are fragmented subjects. We should rather believe that we are unified subjects and we are the consciousness that gives meaning to those images and this is very necessary this is the ideological task of the uh, cinematographic apparatus and the that is achieved by creating this kind of narrative continuity so that we watch the movie we don't while we're watching the movie we don't question at all how these shots came together we watch it without thinking about the technology at all the technology is hidden now, in the last section titled The Screen Mirror, Specularization and Double Identification, Baudry goes into this in a bit more detail. He, he talks more deeply about this by drawing on the psychoanalytic theories of Jacques Lacan, especially the concept of the mirror stage. And this is something that has influenced later film theorists like Christian Metz and Laura Mulvey. The entire theory of gaze that Laura Mulvey talks about draws upon these ideas that Baudry is talking about. Okay, uh, first of all, what is specularization? Specularization means uh, giving something the attributes of a mirror, specular, mirror-like. So there is a specularization and a double identification happening at the moment that we are watching the film on the screen. How does this happen? The film is projected onto a blank screen in a darkened hall and the setting captures and captivates the viewer. First of all, when we watch a film in a theatre, again these are all talking about watching films in a theatre, there is a darkened hall where we do, we are, it's almost as if we are captured in a darkened hall, we don't know what is going on around us. There are people sitting around us, there are things happening outside the cinema theatre, but we are unaware of all that, we are just staring at the screen. And the screen itself is blank and the film is projected onto the blank screen. The screen onto which moving images are projected is compared to a mirror. So Baudry compares the screen to a mirror. How? by drawing on Jacques Lacan's concept of the mirror stage. And mirror stage, according to Lacan, is a stage in the psychosexual and linguistic development of a child, which happens when the child is between 6 and 18 months of age, in which the child begins to identify or misidentify itself as a whole subject based on its apparently whole reflected image in a mirror. You are familiar with this idea, the child when the child first catches sight of himself or herself in a mirror. Before that, the child thinks of himself as an extension of the mother. But it is only when the child catches sight of himself in a mirror that the child begins to identify himself as an individual. But this identification is based on a certain misrecognition. 
or misidentification because the image in the mirror is not the actual child the image in the mirror seems to be much more coordinated than the actual child it is an ideal image it is what lacan would call the ideal i or the i, I ego ideal the child looking at its own image in the mirror believes that i am that image but actually the child is not as coordinated as the image in the mirror the image in the mirror is always superior to the child but by trying to imitate the image in the mirror by trying to by believing that actually i am a unified subject slowly the child develops into an actual more or less unified subject this is how the development of the child happens i mean of course the child never gets completely unified because there's always a lack in inside the subject that is another thing altogether but what is important here is that just like the mirror gives the child an image of itself that is something more than what it is and effects a certain misidentification or misrecognition which results in the child's growth similarly the screen is a kind of mirror onto which images are projected and these images have a feeling of unity and they make the viewing subject think that okay if i am viewing this this synthesized image this totality then i must also be a unified consciousness i must also be a unified subject which however is a mis recognition this is how the concept of mirror stage is taken from psychoanalytic theory and uh used here by bodri the two important conditions for this imaginary constitution of the self are a suspension of mobility and b predominance of the visual function both of which are true of the cinema viewing experience so the child in front of the mirror has a suspended mobility the child because the child is just 6 to 18 months old the child doesn't have much mobility the child can't actually run around and you know do everything that the child likes this is why we say that the actual child is less coordinated similarly the people sitting in a the theater are also their mobility is suspended they have to sit and watch they have to sit in a darkened room and watch they can't run around they can't move around they can't actually do much so suspension of mobility is there and also predominance of the visual function the child looking at the mirror actually seeing right the visual function is very important there similarly when you are sitting in a movie theater even though there are other senses especially uh, sound uh, is very important but still the predominant sense here is the visual sense so these two aspects are absolutely necessary for the imaginary constitution of the self and they are there in the child who is looking at the mirror that in they are there in that situation these two uh, conditions are also very much present in the cinema viewing experience as well but what is the difference between cinema the cinema screen as a mirror and the actual mirror the reality that is reflected in the screen mirror is not a body but a world that has already been attributed with meaning this is very important it is not that we look at the hero or the heroine in the cinema in the screen on the screen and think that we identify with them that is not actually what happens rather the entire reality that has been projected onto the screen the entire world of the cinema is a constituted world it is an attribute it is something that has been technologically constituted with the intentionality of a consciousness behind it and attributed with meaning so when we watch the movie what we are identifying with is that entire movie the entire world that has been constituted and attributed with meaning bodri says there are two levels of identification here first it is with a character on screen and that is we can understand we when we watch a movie we might identify with the hero or the heroine but secondly and more importantly there is an identification with the camera which stages the spectacle and this is where the whole idea of gaze comes from because the gaze of the camera is continuous with the gaze of the spectator the spectator cannot see anything other than what the camera allows him or her to see and 
if the camera shows you a naked woman then you are actually seeing that naked woman your gaze becomes continuous with the gaze of the camera this is what later malvi and all take to talk about uh, she she uses it to talk about the male gaze the patriarchal nature of the gaze etc but here bodri is just talking about it in a very uh, technological sense so you identify with the character but more importantly you identify with the camera specifically to say the gaze of the camera that stages the spectacle just as the mirror assembles a fragmented body in a sort of imaginary integration of the self the transcendental self unites the discontinuous fragments of phenomena of lived experience into unifying meaning so there are different images different sounds different sights different things that are all fragmented reality outside us objective reality is actually fragmented and we might experience objective reality in a fragmented sense and that actually means that we the our consci- our consciousness is also not a unified one in actuality but when these fragments are brought together in the form of a synthesized whole in terms of the cinema and here it is not just about editing it is not just about you know the uh, different uh, captured images on the film reel being pulled f- together in a flow it is not just that but so many things are brought together in a film so that in a 2 hour or 3 hour film you see an entire world which seems to have a unity of its own so there is a narrative unity there is a visual unity there is all kinds of unity in that film so technology is used to assemble all these fragmented things in material reality into a unified or synthesized whole in the form of the film that is being projected onto the screen and this is done by the transcendental self and as i said the transcendental self is not your self or my self it is that what we call the viewing subject it is a particular consciousness it is a particular we can even say imaginary consciousness that assembles all these things together that transcends the possibilities of the actual objective real material self the ideological mechanism at work in the cinema is concentrated in the relationship between the camera and the subject so as we have already mentioned this is precisely where ideology works where the technologies of the camera create a very unified image gives it to the viewing subject and makes the viewing subject believe that i am seeing through the eyes of the camera believe that i am actually the unified subject that is represented by the gaze of the camera whereas actually no human being can be that unified subject as we said earlier the camera is able to capture things that human beings can't actually capture with their visual capacity but still we are made to believe that our gaze is continuous with that of the camera ideology functions here precisely by rendering the cinematic apparatus invisible by hiding the process or work of the apparatus and thereby naturalizing its product and the product of ideology is not the image but the transcendental viewing subject this is the most important point which he has been building up to so as we already mentioned ideology can only function by rendering the cinematic apparatus invisible the technology should be invisible hidden we should not be thinking about that technology the process or work of the apparatus must be hidden only the product the final finished product that is a film should be made available for us that will help in naturalizing the product when we see the film we don't question how these things came together we don't while watching a film we don't think about the process that was uh, used to either shoot this scene or to put things together or to edit it together you know you don't think of any of those things you accept it as natural and the actual product of ideology the actual ideological product what is being produced here through this ideological work of the cinematographic apparatus is not the image it is not the a sequence of images that you see on the screen that is not the actual product the actual product is the viewing subject the transcendental viewing subject who is watching this movie 
so the movie is only a minor part of this production process it is not the end product it's not the final product it is only something in between because the movie itself is a means in order to produce this transcendental viewing subject this is the ideological work of the basic cinematographic apparatus thank you